Welcome to the Low Carb MD Podcast, where we seek progress, not perfection. Hello and welcome back to the Low Carb MD Podcast. Tro and I are like little kids right now. We are so excited about this interview. You know, we know when we're out class and we, we, we bring on someone who really understands the science and, and, and life and, and uh, this very important topic. Tro, I'll let you do the intros, but I'm Brian Lenskis and we are excited today. Yeah, so guys, thank you for listening in to the Low Carb MD Podcast. I'm, I'm super excited today. We have somebody smarter than both of us here, a uh, uh, very, very bright uh, consulting psychiatrist in Oxford. Uh, she did her initial training in Hungary, and then she's been in the U- UK since 92 um, and put out amazing kind of uh, research articles that have caught my attention. Uh, and we'll put the links to those in the show notes, one of which which talks about the interplay of the Western diet and um, eating disorders, and another of which which talks about the relationship with binge eating and anorexia and ultra-processed foods. She's written amazing letters uh, in BMJ um, talking about the dramatic rise of processed foods and uh, how obesity is a public health emergency. She's basically written the book on anorexia, um, and and we're very happy to have Dr. Agnes Aiton here, uh, all the way from the UK. And I have to admit, I you know when I read her work, I'm always nodding, nodding, nodding. And then enough, I said enough is enough. We got to get her on the podcast. So I'm like a little schoolboy here. So happy, you know, very happy to have you here. Thank you for agreeing to stoop down to our level. <laughs> yeah, that's a very sweet introduction, and thank you very much for the invitation. I I just wanted to to return the compliment because I'm a great fan of your work, and I have learned an awful lot from your local podcast. Um, and uh, in fact, actually, uh, quite a lot of my interest in in the overlap between metabolic and eating disorders have been. Um, uh, inspired by what I found on Twitter a few years ago, so so you you were uh, a great inspiration, Tro and Brian. Wow, oh, thank you. My my <laughs> my Twitter's a little cleaner than Tro's, but uh, you know. <laughs> but thank oh, you so no, much for joining us. Oh no, we have a psychiatrist here. Oh my God, I know we're going to be analyzed. This is going to. She's out. like, I've got a lot of. I've, it's you know, going to be an hour just about narcissistic you, personality disorders. Yeah, yeah. on my on my chart. I'm sure after this. Yeah. Well, Doc, tell us, get, you know, fill us in on one, what your research is and, and what you're discovering with the ultra-processed foods and, and the impact it's having on us. Um, well, uh, this is something, uh, a recent interest of, of, of mine, which I developed with um, uh, my um, highly esteemed um, trainee who was just finishing his training, uh, Ali Ibrahim. And as I, as I mentioned to you, we are kind of interested in trying to understand what are the implications of the changing patterns of, of food consumption, uh, both on uh, metabolic and neurobiological pathways, but also on um, uh, disordered eating and eating disorders, uh, particularly in parallel uh, to, to the obesity epidemic. Um, and kind of, I think it was sort of quite an interesting um, discovery doing this narrative review because we were trying to pull together quite a lot of um, um, separate research areas uh, which quite often happen in 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 silos in isolation i so i don't know whether your audience wants to know a little bit about the background of eating disorders because uh, what i'm seeing on twitter there is quite a bit of confusion about eating disorders. Oh, so we would love a background. That? Absolutely. We yeah. would all, you know, this is a hot topic for people, especially physicians, because they're concerned about causing eating disorders, about uh, are they witnessing somebody on a, you know, very low carb diet? Is that a, is that an eating disorder? So this is, we need education. So we hope, please educate us. Tell us how we should think about it, how we should view it. Yeah, I, I think it's probably helpful to think about eating disorders um, in a kind of a historical context. Um, and um, uh, I was just sort of thinking that actually uh, gluttony is regarded uh, amongst the seven deadly sins. 
Uh, but uh, to be honest, I don't think there is much kind of historical description of what gluttony means and why would there be deadly sin or, or whatever. In, in terms of uh, probably the most well-known eating disorder is anorexia nervosa. And um, uh, there are historical descriptions from, from the Middle Ages, mainly I'm aware of uh, Christian saints who ended up with severe dietary restriction and look like that they could have had a, a, an anorexia uh, nervosa type presentation. But actually the first medical description was uh, in uh, 1689 in England uh, when um, uh, the physician concerned kind of recognized, well, actually, this is the psychological problem causing self-salvation. And, and he described uh, both male and female uh, patients. The name of anorexia nervosa was given in uh, 1874, and um, it was regarded as a much rarer condition than, for example, schizophrenia. So it wasn't really uh, studied much. And I think that there was a recognition um, a lot later, so probably 1960s, 70s, when in the US they described um, a 400% increase of anorexia nervosa um, uh, in, in the population, but it was still kind of very rare. And the recent epidemiological studies uh, internationally kind of now suggest that uh, overall kind of prevalence rates is about 0.51% in the, in the population, so lifetime prevalence rates. Uh, so, so anorexia nervosa is, is a rare condition, and obviously it is about um, severe uh, dietary restriction. Uh, it, it is something that um, initially was thought very much kind of culturally influenced, so it was regarded as a uh, as a cultural bound syndrome. Uh, so the idea being that it's, it's a kind of a Western white um, young girl's problem. Uh, but since then, um, anorexia has been described um, uh, around the world, so in most populations. Um, it's interesting that bulimia nervosa um, as a description, and uh, as a separate entity, uh, was described a lot later. So. Um, late 1970s, which is really interesting, and I suppose it is in parallel when, when the obesity epidemic started. Uh, and then binge eating disorder uh, was described in, in the 1980s, and it has only been just introduced in the DSM-5 in, in 2013. Uh, so, so these are the sort of most common uh, eating disorders, um, and there are other eating disorders, but these are the most common ones. And there, there are some common features. So people with eating disorders are usually preoccupied with weight and shape, usually have difficulties kind of uh, controlling their weight, um, usually restrict their diet, uh, and then they may or may not be injured, and they may or may not use various kind of compensatory um, uh, mechanisms and and actually Christopher Fairburn, who is a, who was a professor here in Oxford, kind of used the transdiagnostic concept of eating disorders because there are some commonalities between uh, these eating disorders. Um, we, I think, as a field, we have a problem with our treatment. Uh, so, as much as we have evidence-based psychological treatment. It is, you know, even with the best studies, you have kind of probably 50%, 40 to 50% people recovering with evidence-based treatment. So, so yes, yeah, psychological treatment can help, but it kind of feels that we are missing something. Um, and um, uh, recent studies by um, yeah, Cynthia uh, Bullock's team, uh, who is an American researcher, but working also in in, in Karolinska Institute, uh, have uh, looked at genome-wise association studies, and they have been looking at <clears throat> a, what are the kind of um, genetic factors that may contribute to, to the development of anorexia nervosa. And she was the first one describing, well, actually, 
apart from uh, psychological problems, there is uh, an association with um, um, insulin glucose and, and lipid phenotypes. I, and it is really quite interesting. There have been also some um, a kind of a systematic reviews of the literature, particularly about um, a kind of glucose metabolism and insulin uh, resistance and what it seems to be the case that uh, there are differences kind of metabolically between anorexia, nervosa, and then bulimia and binge eating disorders. So bulimia and binge eating disorders are much more likely to be associated with insulin resistance and uh, with anorexia with insulin sensitivity. And then obviously these are uh, association studies, so you don't know the causality. But I think it's um, a really important observation, and I think um, that's why we do need to learn from you guys, the, the metabolic experts, you know, how, how eating behavior is influenced by these various metabolic pathways. Um, does that I, I, sort of make sense? Oh, so no, no, this is a perfect introduction. And I, so and I want to. We, we've been silently gloating while you're talking, because this is what we've been talking about and being ridiculed for. So having an expert come on and, and support what, we, what we've been experiencing clinically is very exciting. Tro? Yeah, uh, one of the, you know, in your um, uh, systematic review and, and review in, in uh, nutrition reviews on the Western diet, one of the, the key things that stood out was the global approach to, um, to eating disorder, to disordered eating. And and really categorizing some of the unifying factors and uh, particularly the hormonal impacts on loss of control and weight gain. Um, and, you know, the, and not only that, the, the, the combination of the metabolic and the reward pathways that you brought up along with the carbohydrate insulin model, along with uh, several other, you know, key data points really sparked my interest in your work. Um, so can you talk about this, this, you know, the interplay between obesity, loss of control, potentially addictive foods, and the desire and those impact, the metabolic impacts of those foods, and the desire of a patient to fit a body image or body type and to respond to these metabolic and reward pathways that may, they may not understand. Right. So here you are, you know, I guess stereotypically, but you, you know, we can use me as an example. I was a 14 year old uh, chubby kid who was not happy with his body image and I didn't eat for 30 days. Okay. So uh, I grew up on processed food. I wasn't happy with the result and I felt the need to respond to that loss of control with more control. And then once I fasted for two weeks, I felt like on top of the world. So, you know, let's decon, don't, you don't need to deconstruct me. I'm just lending my example to this <laughs> issue of losing control, wanting to restrict, and then going back to losing control. Um, yes, I mean, we kind of elaborated quite a bit because um, I suppose I want to be cautious. So if we are challenging yeah. the paradigm, then we need to be uh, kind of careful what is a hypothesis, what is, what is an observation, what is a, an individual experience, what is an association. So I suppose, um, you know, what we uh, were kind of trying to look at, what is the evidence on an epidemiological level that there is an increase um, in parallel uh, with the obesity epidemic, an increase of disordered eating. Because I think that's the, that's the first step. And, um, and there aren't that many studies on that, because as I said, you know, there are, uh, all of the research is happening in silos. But there was an Australian uh, study uh, by the Lewis where they looked at the prevalence of obesity and comorbid eating disorders uh, between 95 and 2015. So there was quite a long, uh, longitudinal study. And, and they found um, uh, a really high uh, um, increase, like sevenfold increase of um, uh, obesity and binge eating, and then an eleventh fold 
uh, increase of obesity and strict fasting, which is kind of describing your experience. And I think, um, I mean, I, <clears throat> I think it's very interesting because uh, it, it almost seems like there are uh, kind of multiple uh, mechanisms kind of happening here. So you are in the modern processed food environment that um, increasing your <clears throat> appetite and again, uh, particularly in the study by Kevin Hall's uh, work when they compared ultra processed food um, and and uh, kind of un unprocessed or minimally processed food kind of showed that very clearly that people overeat, um, people overeat by 500 calories. So people then end up being <clears throat> um, um, kind of gaining weight. And, and I suppose you, you were talking about your own experience I think I'm sort of a very typical person living in in um, in the West. Uh, so I was just one of those people who kind of put on two kilos every every year, and then you know, ten years down the line, you kind of think, well, oh God, you know what's happening here, kind of thing. <laughs> and then uh, we were told that story, oh well, that happens with age, and don't worry about it. Um, uh, so so I think. Um, this, this particular study kind of showed, well, actually, when people are um, a kind of increasing in their weight, then they will uh, increase um, kind of dieting and they will try to um, control their weight. And uh, there are other studies looking at, you know, when people diet. And there are some differences between males and females. Uh, so females uh, tend to be more worried about the weight and shape uh, through the lifespan. Uh, but particularly young women, um, kind of 15 to 30, 25, that sort of an age, have a very high rate of dieting. Uh, men, on the other hand, tend to be dieting when they actually become overweight or obese. Uh, so you guys probably have a better sense of <laughs> what to do, kind of mm -hmm. thing. <laughs> um, but there is a strong link uh, between um, increasing weight um, and, and dieting. So, um, so I think that's quite clear. And then the really interesting study was actually in Fiji. And, and it's absolutely fascinating because um, uh, Fiji uh, introduced uh, American foods. Um, I can't quite remember when that was, but kind of very suddenly. I think it was 1970s and sort of a, maybe 1980s. Um, and uh, since then, there has been a rapid change uh, of population health. So I think Fiji now has one of the highest rate of diabetes in, in the world. And they also have uh, one of the highest rate of um, a obesity. So there was a very rapid change from a traditional diet, you know, fish, fruit, whatever, uh, to uh, ultra processed food uh, because of the trade agreement. And um, an American researcher has a researcher Becker actually found that there was also an increase of um, bulimia uh, in that population, um, uh, which was kind of new. Uh, but her kind of assumption or investigation was looking at television adverts and looking at television kind of soap operas, so whether the girls kind of wanted to uh, lose weight because they yeah. saw the American actresses and ignored actually what was happening in the food environment. <laughs> so, so I think, I think these, these things kind of need to be uh, pulled together. And then in terms of, I, I, I don't think I need to explain to you guys um, uh, the, the importance of, of the modern diet, although, although I don't know how many people are familiar with the, with the NOVA classification. Are people familiar with that? I mean, we we've pro we have, may have mentioned it in relation to um, – we've discussed some of the issues with potentially, you know, dried meats being considered Nova 4 foods. We've discussed uh, how uh, Kevin Hall used that in, in his study to, to, to separate the arms uh, that you alluded to, which showed a five to 600 calorie difference in consumption. But I don't think we've gotten into it in detail. Would you mind educating us? Okay, so um, again, this is something that um, was recently uh, introduced by a Brazilian uh, kind of researcher, 
Carlos Monteiro. And he, he was kind of challenging the existing paradigm. And, and um, I think kind of people kind of think, well, you know, this is not perfect, but also very interesting. So he was kind of saying, well, actually, um, uh, we need to look at how much industrial processing is there. Uh, in the food, uh, what we are eating. Um, and I suppose because of my age, I kind of started realizing that I'm probably one of the few people living on the planet who remembers life with, before uh, process, ultra processed foods. No, no, Brian, um, Brian did residency yeah, with yeah, Osler. Yeah. You know, he yeah. did residency with Osler, so he's right, you know. Okay, okay. No, but uh, it is a serious, sorry, I'm partially joking, but, but it is a serious point um, because these uh, things have been introduced, you know, 1980s, so we have a whole generation who who haven't actually, um, yeah, mm -hmm. I know. Me, you know, Me uh, present well, guilty. Yeah. yeah. All, all, all of my trainees, they, they just don't know life uh, uh, before ultra processed food. So, so unprocessed and minimally processed food are traditional foods that you kind of um, pick up from the tree or, um, you know, kill an animal or catch a fish and then you cook it kind of thing. Um, and then processed culinary ing ingredients, which would be Nova 2, uh, would be uh, things like that mankind has produced for a very long time so uh, olive oil cream um, a flour etc dry fruit or vegetable right. yeah and then uh, number three would be kind of canned food um, or or frozen food uh, which again has been around for almost a uh, hundred years or maybe maybe not quite a hundred years but at least about 70 years I would think. And then the uh, Nova four foods are the ultra processed foods, such as soft drinks, any kind of pre-packaged snack, um, a diet and low fat products, um, uh, ready meals, um, oven chips, etc. And I suppose when, when you look into the, the composition of this Nova four foods and we, we put up some labels, it is horrifying actually. <laughs> because, yeah. because, because, uh, yes, they kind of tell you, well, you know, how many grams of fat or sugar or whatever is in them, but there are also um, a large number of various chemicals in them. And these chemicals are not necessarily a metabolically inert. Right. So and I, and I think I, in your study, you put a protein bar. And yeah. soy nuggets, I think, was the other one, or something like that, or an ice cream. Yeah, right? that's right. Noble uh, fours, right? Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Where, where does pasta and, and rice fit in there? A, um, I think pasta and rice would be uh, Nova two. Two. And yeah. where does where does uh, the the new fake meat product? Where would that fit in there? Nova four. Nova four. Yeah, yeah. Nova four. Okay, good. Just uh, that's yeah. what I thought too. I just want to make sure I'm not totally yeah. in left field by myself. Like yeah. Usual. Okay, yeah. number four. Yeah, so, so I suppose, I think the point for me was that, yes, with, with the change of diet and with, with, with the ultra-processed foods, there has been an increase in, in refined carbohydrates and there has been an increase in um, vegetable oils. But um, in addition to that, we also have a bunch of chemicals <laughs> in that food that uh, is not even necessarily on the label. Uh, because the, the labeling regulation varies from country to country. Um, and, and I suppose we found some examples of, of that. I, so, for example, well, I, I looked on the EU website, you know, how many food additives there are, and there are about 14,000, oh, sorry, 1,400 uh, food additives on the EU website. And then I just picked out the a couple of examples. So the propionate is something that they use in uh, to prevent molding, uh, and they put it in in um, kind of various reconstituted meat, in bread, dairy products, um, etc. And these have been actually shown to uh, increase insulin resistance and hyperinsulinemia, uh, both in animal experiments and in humans. And then the other kind of big group is, is emulsifiers such as transglutaminase 
and and that is uh, used to uh, extend shelf life, improve consistency, particularly low fat products. Because if you kind of take the fat out of a yogurt, you have to put something in. So you will be putting in sugars and emulsifiers just to kind of get the texture and the, and the kind of enjoyability of, of the food. And um, actually the transglutaminases have been uh, uh, shown to damage the mucus structure uh, of, of the intestinal wall, uh, cause inflammation and, and um, autoimmune uh, difficulties. And, and there is a link, actually, there is an association between eating disorders and autoimmune disorders, which is really interesting. So, so I'm, I'm sort of thinking, well, you know, we just need to be mindful that there is a lot of things going on. Um, and I suppose the other thing, which is the artificial sweeteners, and, and again, I'm, I'm, I'm learning, I was learning when we were doing this review, and <laughs> uh, um, I, I don't know how many people are aware that the artificial sweeteners are quite often used with um, natural sweeteners. So in reduced sugar um, products, you, you have both. Um, and um, you know, the, the person who is doing kind of really exciting um, uh, neurobiological research on this is, is Dana Small's team in, in Yale. So if you can invite her uh, <laughs> next time. <laughs> All right. Yeah. You know, I, I, think, I, I, I think this is very interesting. That One is the, you know, the, these foods, you know, we take them for granted. They're so ubiquitous. I think in one of your... Uh, reviews you mentioned, you know, up to 75% of the average diet is these Nova 4 foods. Not only are they having this super additive effect of carbs and fat usually, but they're t laden with these, you know, uh, uh, potential environmental issues, which we had uh, Leo Trasande, Dr. Leo Trasande talk about a little bit to us um, early on. So, so that clearly they have a, both an, a metabolic impact and an impact on our reward structure. Uh, yeah. And on top of that, they're so sweet, we probably habituate to the sweet and savory yeah. tastes that they provide. So now our sweet and savory taste preference has been hijacked. Our, you know, uh, our reward systems have been hijacked and our metabolic hormonal systems have been hijacked. And then yeah. now here we are trying to restrict and, you know, we're wondering what caused an eating disorder, you know, and maybe critics of a low carb diet or a vegan diet or whatever it is, they, um, they say it's these diets that cause the eating disorder. Uh, but you're, we're hinting here that a, as a potential hypothesis that maybe it's something else. So, you know, can you help me answer that question? Because I get a lot of people that say, you know, we're going to create orthorexia and even that topic is a laden with controversy. But, you know, will a diet, will a way of eating that's real food promoting cause an eating disorder? Will an intermittent fasting a protocol cause an eating disorder? What are your thoughts about that comment, you know, that's very frequent in the industry that these things could cause an eating disorder? Okay, so, so I kind of uh, uh, will try to give you a, a, a nuanced answer. Uh, so the, there is definitely um, evidence, uh, particularly young people who restrict their diet um, are more at risk of eating disorders. So quite often, um, you know, eating disorder like anorexia nervosa start in adolescence um, and it could be triggered off by uh, somebody restricting their diet for a long period of time. Um, a, so I think it does depend on when and how, um, a, and maybe what as well. Um, so I, a, I, I suppose, um, you know, when you're talking about someone who is an adult, and um, a, has, is overweight or has metabolic uh, problems, if they um, are moving away from a high carb uh, diet and they are moving um, uh, towards intermittent fasting, uh, that would be metabolically healthy. I think the evidence is quite strong on that. Uh, so, um, 
uh, that's quite a different thing from um, a teenager or a 12 year old who is restricting the diet in a similar way. So, so I suppose uh, there isn't one size fits all. And I think that's one of the kind of weaknesses of our current treatment in eating disorders, uh, because the, uh, internationally, um, and I hope I won't be shut down too much about this, um, but, but this, the main psychological treatments, they might kind of differ in terms of how to address the psychopathology. They all say, well, use the eat well plate, uh, eat regularly. It doesn't matter what you're eating. And I suppose what we were kind of trying to say, well, it does matter what you're eating. Yes. Uh, uh, because, um, and, and I said, uh, as I said, you know, um, Donna Small's work uh, was really wonderful to highlight that. So, so she was kind of saying, well, we have a, uh, or, or they have a two-stage model bringing together the biological and psychological factors. And um, a, if you are having natural foods, then there is a, a, a system in the brain which is preserved um, during evolution um, that directly reflects the nutritional value of foods um, and relies on metabolic signals reaching the brain. And then when you have uh, some of these NOVA4 foods, um, a, either a, a combination of high carb, high, um, high uh, fat combination or um, artificial sweetener and um, natural sweeteners that then actually overrides that um, uh, uh, normal mechanism. Um, and then what she was saying that in a second system, you know, we as human beings, obviously, we value the information around us. Uh, so we are very much influenced by diet industry, what's on the advert, what's around you, um, is that good for me or bad for me? Um, so I, I think that's a, sort of a really nice way of describing what is happening. So kind of going back to your question, um, I, can uh, people kind of going or moving away from Nova 4 foods uh, cause an eating disorder? I think in my opinion, the chances of the pretty much zero. Uh, because you would actually uh, restore the normal uh, satiety mechanism. I want to talk about that chance of zero because in your other, in your very recent, I think it was a case series you did looking at binge eating, you showed that 100% of late night binging, and I think it was 100% of all binging was Nova 4 foods. And I thought, holy crap, my jaw dropped when I read that. I'm like, this is it. Nobody's binging on steak. You know, yeah, no, no one says I'm going to go broccoli. eat broccoli until I throw up, right? I, I, you know, and that's, that is such a massive point. I think, Tro, Doc, we took a lot of heat because we were looking, we were observing that people were, when they changed their diet, pornography addiction was game. They were self-reporting this. We weren't asking them. They said pornography addiction was game, alcohol, drugs, all these different things that they were doing. When they got their diet right and they decreased their insulin level and they're eating a healthy diet with Nova one and two foods. Uh, these other addictions started to get better. And we're seeing that uh, psychologically. And one of the big questions was, one of the big frustrations in medicines is poorly controlled diabetics have depression. And everyone thought people got depressed and because they didn't care anymore, their sugars got out of control. But what we're seeing is the sugars got out of control first and then they got depressed. So we're talking about inflammation, insulin in the brain and all this. And I think the approach to treatment has been off. We, we're looking at it backwards sometimes. I would love to hear your opinion on that. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I absolutely agree. And I think these kind of clinical observations are really important. I, and I suppose any uh, discovery has to be based on clinical observation. I mean, I know that we have a, a kind of a, a fetish about randomized controlled trials, but um, uh, randomized controlled trials have to come from somewhere. And the clinical observation is really the first step. So, so the, the paper you were referring to, um, through, it's still in preprint. So, and I'm still waiting for somebody to publish it. <laughs> um, but we were just kind of using our own clinical sample, uh, just out of curiosity as a next step following the review, kind of thinking, well, okay, so what is it that the patients are reporting that they are eating? And, um, uh, a, you know, 
patients um, can binge in any diagnostic category. So there is anorexia, binge purging subtype, obviously bulimia, binge eating, uh, all this is binging in there. And what we found, and, and to be fair, it's, it probably shouldn't be surprising uh, that people are always binging on over four foods. And, and then I suppose um, then it, it really does need to be explored a little bit more. You know, why is that? Uh, but I think it would kind of beautifully fit in um, with the neurobiological study that uh, Donna Small's group have, have found. So people, uh, so the satiety signals seem to be uh, overridden, so people don't stop eating. Um, and, and, and I suppose, um, I, th I think we desperately need more studies to kind of test out, well, actually, if we change the food, Will that get better? Yeah, uh, yeah I'm sorry. Just, just an anecdote along this line. I have a lady who binge eating disorder, fatty liver disease. She asked me how to get better fatty liver disease. I said, cut the carbohydrates. Her nutritionist called me the next day cussing at me, literally cussing at me because she said, I'm going to cause her to binge eat. I said, she's already binge eating. So she said, if you tell them not to eat sugary foods, they're going to binge on sugary foods. And I said, well, do you tell your alcoholics to have a drink a week so they don't binge on alcohol? It's the same. It's the same premise, because at some point, once you eat the sugary foods, that's when people go off the road. That's why you hear about people on a ketogenic diet. They do great for six months. Or Rob Zyba is a good friend of mine. Lost a hundred pounds, but he came back thirty pounds three different times. Why? As soon as he had sugar, he couldn't stop for a month, right? And so, yeah. knowing what he knows in his educational background, he just knows he's an addict. That that's his his opinion that he's addicted to carbohydrates. He can't stop once he has one. I, I think, um, you know, the, I don't know how much time you guys have, but I, I, I think one of the really important kind of technological advances are actually the glucose monitors. Uh, so so having, having a continuous glucose monitor can provide in individual feedback. And, and this is a study we wanted to do before COVID, and then COVID came and everything stopped. So we haven't done it, but I'm hoping that we will be able to do that. But I have, I have had one patient uh, of mine, uh, well, actually not, not a patient, but uh, an acquaintance on Twitter. <laughs> and I was just saying, well, why don't you just try out having your glucose, um, checking your glucose response? And just having that feedback for him uh, made a massive difference. And, and, and I suppose... That kind of fits in with this sort of theory. Well, actually, people with bulimia binge eating probably are more likely to have hypoinsulinemia. Maybe they are more sensitive to um, kind of high sugary, uh, carb high carbohydrate foods, etc. So, so I think having that individual feedback probably takes the heat out of the situation because you can't argue with that one. Well, and, and your countryman also, Dr. Unwin, was talking about yeah. elevated triglycerides stimulating appetite making you eat more so then you get into the cycle when you're eating chips and cookies and candy and then it makes you want it more and more and the addictive properties of the foods that know before foods like you're talking about it's a perfect storm right isn't that yeah. a perfect storm once you get into that cycle it's hard to break that yeah i mean i think it's really interesting and we definitely need more more research on that but i suppose just kind of going back to Tron's question will um um changing the diet cause an eating disorder no but you need to be kind of sensitive to the person's needs and metabolic responses. Yeah, you know, I, I want to, you know, we do have a couple more minutes. I think, Brian, what do we have? About 10, 15 more minutes. I want to talk on one more topic. Um, you know, for the longest time, uh, people have asked me, why do you eat low carb and why do I intermittent fast? And I explained to them, I do it for its anorexigenic effects because I don't want to be hungry. Okay. I don't want to be hungry. And people hear that and they're like, anorexia, anorexigenic, you know, but I believe that the ketones probably act on the brain. I believe those high triglycerides act on the brain. I believe that chronic um, high carb, high fat foods act on the brain. And I don't want to be hungry. I've lived a life of constant hunger. So I use these... Uh, you know, uh, these tools to be less hungry. So, I, I, yeah, true. I think you need to change your language. Sorry. 
Yeah, yeah. help me change my language. Yeah. I, you know, but that's the I've way. I've been telling her change his language for a couple of years now, but so, that's a different uh, topic. So, it, I, but oh. that's the way we have to describe it. Maybe I, maybe the right. I do believe you want to have they, satiety. You want to have they, satiety. They, they, they mitigate my hunger. I wish I could describe it. I mean, how would you help me describe it? Satiogenic, <laughs> satiogenic. Well, um, well, I, um, I probably have to think about it. It's not my first language anyway, but, yeah. but, um, but my, my kind of thinking is you, you kind of want to actually reset your appetite regulation from yeah. something which is abnormal to, to normal. Uh, and I suppose if you use the word anorexigenic or whatever it is, then, then it, it almost kind of sounds abnormal. And, and I suppose, you know, this sort of constant hung, hunger in a, in a processed food environment, um, I think is very familiar to everyone. Uh, and uh, I, I suppose after I kind of came across this um, field of research, um, I did stop having um, cereals. And, and, and uh, the change was just sort of amazing. And then I kind of started remembering back to my childhood. We never had cereals, we didn't know what it was. Uh, we never had kind of coke because that was forbidden in the, behind the iron curtain. That was <laughs> not something that you would have, so you would have water. Um, and, um, and, you know, we weren't hungry all the time. I, and then when I kind of moved to the Western diet with all the packaging and everything, I was constantly hungry. And, um, and, you know, I was gaining weight and I was sort of thinking, well, why am I hungry? This is not okay. Why, why am I hungry? And, and you know, um, this is actually uh, an abnormal response to abnormal foods. Can I, can I stop you for one second? Imagine being a 12-year-old with no education and having severe body image issues from media and experiencing constant hunger. And please tell yeah. me that that doesn't cause eating disorders. Yeah. No. Yeah. I mean, no. sorry. I feel strongly about it because at the age of thirteen or fourteen, I fasted for thirty days. Well, you know? and I and I'm very I'm very feel very strongly when people, you know, suggest critics suggest that, you know, our approach may cause an eating disorder, because no, I, I, I've been there. You know. Okay. I mean, I suppose what I would say we shouldn't be feeding our children that stuff. Uh, and I, uh, I, and I'm sort of horrified when I look at, for example, uh, formula milk, and how that is advertised, and what is the metabolic effect of that on on babies. And um, orange juice and, and juices and and saying that's healthy for the kids and you know this cereal, oversupply of cereal and you know ed, you know food, you know they consider baked potato and cheese a protein, in my school district. You know. Yeah, I mean that's probably um, yeah. yeah. Cheese not, sauce, I should say, um, not cheese. Some, some, the, the, the other stuff, but but you know, I mean, it is. Um, I th I think the ultra processed foods are particularly harmful, and we have a whole generation like yourself, who um, haven't actually experienced anything else, which is uh, kind of unique in human history. It didn't used to be like that. Uh, I, I got a little granddaughter, and we're kind of trying to remove her from too much <laughs> ultra processed food. And 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 um, it's really quite interesting. She was breastfed, um, and she was ketotic as a baby. You could smell on her uh, breast when she was little. She was quite clearly ketotic as a baby, as a breastfed baby, and her appetite regulation is fantastic. Uh, so she will eat, and then I'm finished. And I don't want to snack, and I don't want anything to do. So that's how it should be normally. Uh, and and uh, the the problem is that uh, uh, these um, kind of ultra processed foods um, interfere with a normal appetite regulation. So I suppose you go going back to to your point. You you want to regain your normal appetite regulation. Yeah, and and imagine all those. I mean the 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 young men and women that you work with who are lost. They can't understand what CCK is and ghrelin is and triglyceride excursions and glycemic excursions and insulin. They look in the mirror and they see weight gain or they experience loss of control and they tie that to a body image that they want to attain. I, that's eating disorder to me. 
Well, what's the, what's the chicken and the egg here as far as like bulimia? Do people gain weight first and then become bulimic or do they binge eat to get overweight and then they start having more bulimic episodes? Do, do we know that or is that individualized? Well, usually there is a, a, a concern about weight and shape. Mm -hmm. and, and, um, and, and that's why I think the obesity epidemic is relevant to eating disorders because the more people uh, gain weight, the more people are obese, the more people will end up dieting and some people will develop an eating disorder. And as I said, you know, there is some uh, epidemiological evidence. And I use the Australian and the Fijian example um on an individual basis um i mean i think in in terms of particularly during adolescence but even through the lifespan you know people want to look attractive um a, in adolescence there is a really intense competition you know do i look better than the next girl or next boy um do i get teased um etc so um so the so the worry about appearance is pretty normal um the issue is that if you really have to kind of counter um, act on um, on the food environment with a conscious effort uh, because your appetite regulation is short to pieces um, and then add, add um, adverts around around that uh, you know um, fitness look, look, diet. Wait, look, but look this good go on a 21 day juice fast go you know yeah, yeah. Uh, go to the you know come to the gym so you can well yeah, yeah. The, the other thing we see clinically is this you know it just happened last week I had a patient come in you know a couple of weeks ago and he said I'm not gonna fast I'm never gonna fast and I said okay don't worry about it because he had a fear of being hungry a real fear of being hungry at some point so he said I said don't worry about it eat when you're hungry like Tro says eat when you're hungry you know eat real food and mm -hmm. see what happens and he came in last week. He said, "You're not going to believe it. Yesterday I didn't have breakfast or lunch. I wasn't even hungry. I was. I couldn't. He was shocked by it, right? And that's kind of what Tro and I experienced too. It was like, okay, skip breakfast and lunch, and you know. So we see, and it's not a willpower thing. It's that he said, I just wasn't hungry. I didn't have that. He. It was strange to him. And Paulo is one that we had on the podcast that really opened my eyes to that because he was eating every hour basically, and he was obese and had all these health problems. And then all of a sudden he's three or four days in, he got fat adapted and he was feeling better. And he it took away that binge. Because for me, it's, I've observed it. I'm trying to really put this all together. But what I see is people's anxiety, stress, depression seems to get better when they get their, their processed foods out of their diet. And then they're less likely to stress eat because most of us who are overweight, stress eat. We're stressed out. We have a hard day. Tro's being mean to me and I want to eat a cookie, right? So, you know, it's those kind of things where you start realizing, wow, there's more to it. Like what you're saying, there's a psychological aspect and there's the physiologic aspect. There's a lot of it psychological too, because you just like certain foods and you, it, it makes you feel good. So you get that rush. And I've always wondered that. And I've always, and, and, and part of it, I'm wondering, because bulimia and anorexia, you know, bulimics, I see it, that you're overweight and you're trying to get back to normal weight. So you think, okay, I got to get rid of this food that I ate, or I'm going to exercise to, to overcome what I did. But I'm wondering if anorexia a lot of times is, is uh, underlying depression or not being happy with yourself and they get into the state of ketosis and they feel a little better and then they like that feeling. I don't know. I don't know if that's until part of they it. Until they're stressed. I mean, this was outlined so well until the stress hormones go up because they're exactly. so malnourished. Exactly right. And they're, they have to eat and then they don't want to eat because they felt so good in ketosis. And it's that yeah. cycle that you- Exactly. I, I want to say, I, I, you know, Agnes, Dr. Aiden, that- one picture is like what every single primary care doctor and psychiatrist needs to put on their freaking wall. Yeah, absolutely. Well, um, I, uh, I, thank you for the compliment. I, I need to acknowledge uh, Professor Fab and we, because we were building on his transdiagnostic model, a psychological model uh, of eating disorders and kind of trying to add in uh, the metabolic aspects and the food environment aspects. And, and I suppose the, the, the adverts and, and the confusing messages from media are hugely influential. So I had a patient who had a, a kind of a complicated um, uh, treatment-resistant epilepsy uh, and an eating disorder. And I was kind of uh, suggesting, well, you know, why don't you try um, a, a ketogenic diet because there is evidence for epilepsy, etc. Um, and she did try, but then she went, goes to the supermarket and uh, gets freaked out because you have low uh, fat adverts everywhere. Yeah. 
uh, you go to the yogurt aisle and uh, you have to search for the one full fat yogurt <laughs> and all the others um, have emulsifiers and whatever else in them. Uh, so, so I suppose that's what people are uh, up against. And then I suppose the younger generation like you, Tro, um, has, has no memory of a different world. So you, do, you don't remember. You don't remember life without uh, breakfast cereal. Nope. I don't and then I, and I, I just kind of can't comprehend that because I'm sort of, that is, you know, what have we done? You'll, you'll, there's not one breakfast cereal in our house now. Okay. We're awake. We're awake to this. I, I want to talk about this, Brian. I know I'm going to cut you off, but you know, I think one of the two of the big things we face um, as primary care docs looking to uh, kind of talk about uh, mental health and mental health improvement with diet and how diet and fasting could, in fact, both improve mental health and, and uh, uh, metabolic health is these notions that they can cause an eating disorder or they may worsen an eating disorder. For docs out there who are concerned and want to do their best, like me, we screen for it, uh, both you know, anorexia and bulimia, what do you recommend to them? Like, look, you want to be nuanced. You want to at least try to capture something or be aware of something. How do we bring this into our awareness so that we proceed carefully before we prescribe a diet? How do we respect this idea of, you know, causing an eating disorder, um, you know, what should, what should the lay doctor, what should Brian do? What should I do? You know, is there, you know, a screening you recommend or what, what do you, what would you recommend? Um, well, I suppose it is important to, to ask about disorder eating or eating disorder. Uh, it's also important to be uh, non-judgmental. And then I also think that because a lot of people don't volunteer about eating disorder psychopathology because it's hugely embarrassing and shameful. Yeah. Um, a, so if you ask, then then uh, the person might feel that they they can uh, kind of share their difficulties with you. So that that's good. So because the patient feels that they are listened to. I I do think that the, the work by Aaron Siegel's group uh, looking at individual metabolic responses and then Tim Spector's group have uh, repeated that recently. Um, is, is probably a good way in uh, because we, we're not necessarily the same. So a 12-year-old girl and a 60-year-old woman are going to have different metabolic needs. Um, and, um, and similarly, somebody with anorexia or bulimia nervosa might have very different kind of metabolic makeup. Uh, so, so I suppose it is about looking at what is the the patient kind of metabolic kind of baseline, what it is that they are eating, and then what changes they can make. Um, the other thing which I kind of really like about your work, um, Troll, that you're very clear about this dangling exercise from uh, any nutritional intervention, because I think that's really important, particularly for eating disorders. I and mean, we have uh, huge problems with uh, patients kind of calorie counting or feeling that they have to earn food with exercise, that sort of stuff. Um, and it's not effective and it's harmful. So people just kind of go around like in a, a, um, in a vicious cycle and can't get out of them. So, so I really uh, think that kind of distangling the two things is, is important. We, we call it moving away from relying on the central planner. We don't want you to rely on your central planner to determine what to eat. You know, okay. we, we want to give an environment of food that promotes satiety and we'd want to take away the need to impulse control. That is our general approach. Um, and thank you for the compliment. See, Brian, I'm not so bad. No, you're brilliant, Tro. <laughs> and just for the record, Tro picks on me more than I pick on him now. I've, been, I've, I've, I'm. Uh, <laughs> what have I? I'm rehabbed. I'm yeah, rehabbed. Just, no, no, just, much respect. You just respect. want to get something. No, Tro, in the DSM chart. That's what, you you're know, doing. You you're doing great work. You're doing great stuff, and I'm learning. And this is what I love: is learning from all of us. Saying, okay, let's put our egos away for a minute. And it's not about being humble. It's about learning. And we're on a, a mission of learning. And I think that's what happens is 
So many people want to pigeonhole and say, oh, all they do is ketogenic, that's it. Well, no, you have to look at the patient in front of you. We individualize things and we learn because the way I might react to having a cookie might be different than someone else or me having yeah. a drink may be different than my alcoholic friend having a drink. And so I think as a society, we have to learn the interconnection. And you know, one thing, Doc, I, I was question, thinking about is in Fiji, they had a huge increase in uh, mental illness also concomitant with the processed foods. Uh, schizophrenia went through the roof, uh, depression, anxiety, all these things. So when we started talking about this, saying, hey, we're seeing people getting better from a mental health standpoint, I, th I think it was an English Dr. Tro that said I should have my license revoked for even questioning that or even saying I'm observing it, right? Remember? Tro? That, that, yeah, yeah. I mean, the, to bring up the idea that diet can affect uh, mental health, we, we got a lot of uh, criticism for. And then since then, there have been interventional studies with real food diets showing Im improved depression scores, uh, interventional studies, not just association studies. So mm -hmm. I think uh, there's something to be said there. Uh, and I think maybe, maybe you should keep your license, Brian. Yep, I think so too. <laughs> yeah. I think someone else might need to have their license revoked for not considering the possibility of what we're seeing clinically in the mental disaster that we have right now in our country, in our world. You know, the mental health problems we're seeing are devastating to our economy and they're devastating to each other, just being kind, decent people. So, Doc, how, how, what do you think about that? Well, I, I'm sort of thinking, um, because um, I don't know, I've always been a bit of a kind of technological geek. And, and I'm sort of wondering whether actually the kind of the flash glucose monitors or, or CGMs when they become more widely used will help people understand what's going on with them. Uh, because, you know, when, when I started trying out my own responses to food, I realized that when I'm eating a, a kind of a typical Western diet, then I'm a constant um, hyperglycemia. Because I am kind of constantly around, you know, we have, I don't know your American things, kind of 9, 10, um, and, you know, just having an orange juice and having a biscuit and then having this or that, the other. So I'm running constantly an abnormally high level blood glucose level. And, and I think it would be really fascinating to do that sort of stuff on a population level and then kind of see, well, actually, what is happening to free living humans in in that kind of processed food environment uh, in terms of their metabolic health we know what's happening with them in terms of their weight um, metabolic disease but kind of having a, a, an indicator I, I think that would be really interesting and then how is that linked with your mood um, uh, etc cetera, etc cetera. yeah this is critically important information i think that's mm -hmm. You know, I said it, Tro, I'll give myself a pat. I said, look, the CGM may be the most important medical breakthrough we've ever had. Maybe. Because we're going to learn a lot about mental health, physical health. Why do I eat? Why am I binging when my sugar is high? Why am I, you know, and we start learning ourselves. And, and it's not my opinion anymore. It's not Tro's opinion. It's not your opinion. It's what happens physiologically. And, and when we start looking at that, you know, okay, when people say, well, banana doesn't raise your sugars, put a CGM and eat three bananas, see what your sugar does. <laughs> Am I wrong or they're wrong? One of us is wrong. And I'm telling you what the numbers show. And I'm telling you what the, the physiological response to our patient is, right? So they'll say, yeah. well, have dates and figs because it's a natural sugar, but they're eating a ton of it in fruit shakes and putting a bunch of other stuff in it. And they're having huge glycemic excursions. And what you're talking about, spiking insulin, stress hormones, all these things that play a role. It's not just about what, plus it's not just about what we're eating. It's a stress. Are we exercising? Are we sleeping enough? Are we in, you know, we can see if you don't sleep, your, your sugars go up. If you don't, you know, if you're mad at your neighbor all the time, your sugars go up. So we start realizing how do I live my life? Not just about the Mediterranean diet, it's about the Mediterranean lifestyle, right? So a lot of us, that's something we're going to learn from CGMs also. Yeah, absolutely, Brian. I can't agree. Uh, this has been this has been absolutely amazing, you know, the, these insights that we're sharing with each other and across disciplines. Dr. Agnes Ayton, we're so happy that you came with us. And if, if somebody wants to reach out with you, uh, whether they uh, are looking for a consultation or looking to chat with you or maybe a research interest, how would they get in contact with you? And can you give us any parting words of wisdom? You know, any parting right. words of wisdom? Okay. I, so I, I only work in the NHS, so, so I don't do any private practice. So probably 
not a good person to to reach out to with individual kind of questions. It would be very interesting if anyone wants to do joint research. Twitter is as good as any. I I I'm on Twitter and um, so and I do do check my messages. So that would be good. And and then I suppose I'm just um, hopeful that we will be able to continue with kind of these cross-discipline conversations and learning from each other is really important. I absolutely love it. You know, I love it. I've been so impressed with the psychiatrists who are looking at diet, diet, not just drugs, to help people, and we're seeing unbelievable success. Um, it's it's really profound, and and your work is so important. It's very encouraging to us because we kind of went out on a limb and said we're seeing this. I can't deny what I'm seeing, and then the science comes and backs up what we're saying after getting ridiculed. So it's kind of fun that way for us. But you know, we're trained to observe and see, is my patient getting better or not? And we see them getting better and you see them getting better and you say, let's change these foods. And I think, you know, just when we realize, you know, like you're saying, it's so critical. You know, one of the things I've, and I'm gonna ask you really quick on the way, and I'm so sorry, Troy, to extend us a couple of minutes, but no, no. When, I, when I grow strawberries in my house or if I have a peach off a tree, that thing's gonna go rotten in two days, a day or two days. If I buy it at the store, two weeks it sits there in my, how, how in the heck is that happening? Right, we're eating all this stuff, and we don't know what the what in the world like. It's not natural what we're doing. They, like, they blasted it with ethylene. They've put wax on it. Yeah, you know what I mean, a, a lot people, of different things. And there. people don't realize that, and they're just mixing it all up, eating it all day long, and and you start wondering why am I starving all the time? And yeah, I don't know how much of an impact. It's just really, it's just stuff we think is natural and great isn't necessarily, you know. And I think that's really important. I think when you grow your own garden or you have your own fruit in your tree, you realize, oh my gosh. All that fruit's gone in a day or two. You can't store it for a month like we can with some stuff we buy at Costco. So I think all these things are critical questions that at some point we really have to address, um, you know, especially with our worsening health and our metabolic disaster that we have in America and, the, and around the world now. Yes, I mean, I, I, I think, um, you know, quite a lot of prominent researchers have called out um, for change in the food industry, obviously. Um, uh, Robert Lustig, Carlos Montero, um, and, and and I suppose the interesting example is, is Japan, uh, because Japan has uh, processed food, and obviously it's a it's a very developed country with the lowest number of metabolic disorders and lowest number of obesity. Uh, so we can actually learn from other countries, you know, how to change processed foods in a way that is um, uh, not metabolically harmful. That's great. Absolutely. We all learned. That is great. So, Doc, thank you for joining us so much. It was an honor having you on, really, and we appreciate your time and your expertise. And I know we went lo long, but this is really, really important. We've, we hit a lot of really important information here. So we thank you so much. And, uh, you know, keep up the great work. We're, we're going to be keeping an eye out for all your articles coming out, and, and uh, it is very exciting. Listeners, thank you so much. Stay on. Thank you. Hope, please. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you, everyone. Thanks for listening. Uh, you learned a lot. This is a great episode, and uh, we really appreciate your support and for following us. Troy, do you want to close this? No, thank you, and just yeah. Dr. Aiden. Thank you so much, and and uh, we'll uh, obviously we'll be in touch, and hopefully maybe one day we can do some research together. Yeah, we'll be very happy to do so. Yeah. All right. All right. Take care. Thank Hey, everyone, thank you so much for your support, for keeping us going. We're hearing great stories. And, and uh, thank you so much for the, all the iTunes uh, props and, and uh, reviews. We greatly appreciate that. And, and for the support on Patreon, you know, we really, really appreciate it. You've uh, helped us just to not have to um, take outside funding and to keep us going. So, Tro, what do you have to say, man? Thank you for listening to the Low Carb MD podcast. We really appreciate every single positive feedback, all the comments, all our listeners, everybody on Patreon who supported us. You guys have kept us commercial free without bias, and we really appreciate it. Thank you so much. And thank you. And if you haven't had time yet, please take a minute and just uh, click a, a review and um, Again, uh, share this with your friends and family. We appreciate it. And we're over a million downloads, believe it or not, Tro. This is super awesome. So thank you all for listening. You are greatly appreciated.